Welcome to Stories We Love. Stories We Love is where I get to interview incredible people and you get to listen to them and then they help us see how life can be so much better than we even knew. Uh, today we get to interview this amazing man who's an author. His name is Mark Gober. And we're going to talk today about some kind of stuff that I know to be true, but that a lot of people don't know to be true yet about how much power we have over lots of things. And so today I just want to introduce you to Mark Gober. Mark, I know you've written some books. Talk to us first about your books. Well, Karen, thank you for inviting me on your show. I've written four books now, and the first one is called An End to Upside Down Thinking, and all the books have the same, a similar style of the title. It's An End to Upside Down Something. So the, the second one's An End to Upside Down Living, then Liberty, and the most recent one's Contact. But with regard to what you were just describing, um, An End to Upside Down Thinking gets to really the fundamental idea that's in all of my books, and it's about the topic of consciousness, which I should add is something that I was never interested in before 2016. And prior to that, my background was in business. I went to Princeton, then went to, into investment banking in New York during the financial crisis. And then I was advising technology companies in Silicon Valley. So I wasn't thinking about that sort of thing. But in 2016, I came across podcasts and then scientific papers, which looked at consciousness. And consciousness basically is just our sense of experiencing. It's our, our subjective, inner awareness. So when I say that I'm speaking to you right now, that sense of I is what I mean by consciousness. And that's a pretty big deal because if we didn't have consciousness, we wouldn't even be able to think or experience anything. And what I was shocked to learn is that science does not understand consciousness. And in fact, Science Magazine has called this the number two question remaining in all of science, which to paraphrase their question is, how is it that the brain could produce consciousness? And what I argue in my book is that the brain does not produce consciousness. Right. I agree with that. That's so interesting. And it's interesting because to me, all of science is impacted by consciousness. If somebody's doing research and they believe it's going to be research that is good, you know, that whatever, they, they have an outcome in mind, they can literally influence the outcome. They can literally influence the subjects, even if they're not conscious that they're doing it. And even if the subjects aren't conscious that the other, that the, person the researcher is, is influencing them it can happen on so many levels and so that makes a lot of studies that are out there questionable because nobody's taking into account the thing that has so much power which is that consciousness yes. so um i love it so uh what was it that made you like so you found podcasts and stuff but what made you open to it that's a really good question it's a deep question i i don't know exactly um, I, I think looking back in my life, I probably was always asking big questions. And when I was studying in undergrad, I started off in the economics department at Princeton and realized I didn't really enjoy it. It was very theoretical. So my sophomore year, which is around the time you have to declare your major formally, I thought about switching to the astrophysics department because I had taken a course in that and I was so fascinated with the universe. So that part of me was probably there. I decided not to do it because I was on the tennis team and it was very time consuming. So I said, I'm going to, I end up studying psychology and blending it with economics. So I've had those big questions probably, but what I concluded because of my education and what I was hearing in the media and things like that was that we were learning more and more that there's no reality to any spiritual dimension. That's just superstition. So I was moving more and more in that direction and thinking life had no meaning. And when you die, that's the end of your consciousness. There's no such thing as psychic abilities. That's nonsense. And that's where I was. I was in a very nihilistic, agnostic, atheistic state before I uncovered all this. Wow. That's so interesting. You know, um, yeah, it's just so, it's so interesting. And I love that you have had a shift. So now it seems like you are clear that there is something more. And what is it that got you that clarity? Well, for me, unlike many people I've spoken to, I haven't had any single major experience that totally transformed my worldview. I've had what I'll call little experiences, a bunch of them that have been very influential and it's over time shifted me. So lots of synchronicities, where there are very strange coincidences where I, when I try to do the math in my head, I realize it's not chance. It's just too weird and happening over and over again. I've also worked with 
many psychics because I was researching the science of that. And I said, well, if psychics are real, then sometimes they should be able to do things that I can't explain. So I've worked with a number of, of people in that field and energy workers. And sometimes they did things that I have not been able to explain by conventional means. And also as I've moved further into this exploration, I've been meditating a lot more. And really the highlight of that was doing two silent meditation retreats, which were about a week long each at the beginning of 2020. And after one of those retreats, I had a significant energy experience. That's the best way I can put it. So I've had some experiences like that, but other than, other than those examples, primarily my path has been an intellectual one where I keep learning about evidence in so many different areas, whether it's telepathic studies, mind-to-mind -mind communication, remote viewing where people can see things with their mind from far away, including the US government's program where they have declassified documents, near-death experiences, children with past life memories, all these different areas where I'm finding scientific evidence. And it got to the point where there was this body of evidence that was so large that I couldn't go back to my worldview if I wanted to be intellectually honest. I couldn't discount every single example of science I was coming across. So I basically resigned myself and said, something is going on <laughs> and it's massive. You need to rethink everything, Mark. That's what I was saying to myself in the fall of 2016. And it was such a disorienting period because my whole worldview changed and I had to rethink all of my assumptions. And it was a very challenging period. Yeah, and I admire you because a lot of people won't do that rethinking of their whole life because in order to really have shifts, you have to be able to perceive things in a new way. Mm -hmm. And for you to be able to do that, uh, just through kind of the stuff you were doing and then having this significant spiritual experience. What was that experience about that did that for you? But I, I also want to just commend you, you know, because you being able to make that shift is something that most people don't even know how beneficial it could be. So what was the spiritual experience that you had that, you know, you that after the two um, retreats? Yeah. The meditation experience. The best way to describe it is that whatever density our body feels like, it, it turned to a very light sensation yeah. and it was inc incredibly pleasurable. So the closest thing I would, I can compare it to is love, but it was beyond that. It had that kind of a feeling and it was so overwhelming to my body that I thought I was going to die. This was pretty quick, maybe a few seconds where it was, this energy was overtaking my body, not like a, a spiritual entity or anything. It was just an energy that I felt. And my body basically shut it down. It happened one other time before that, a few months prior. And both times I had this sensation, especially the one after the long retreat, was if I don't shut this down, I'm going to disappear or die, something like that. That's really what it felt like. And there was this part of me all happening in a split second. You can't do that, Mark, because there would be people who would be very upset <laughs> if that happened. So my body shut it down. But it was one of those things that's so undeniable and extreme that it, it helped reinforce what I've been learning anyway. Yeah, and you know, I think, because I used to have this thing where I would levitate in bed. Um, mm -hmm. When I was living in New York, I, was, I would be, in, I'd be asleep and then all of a sudden I'd wake up, I'd be just like three inches off the bed and then I'd get scared and I'd come down. But I think what it is, is the, the now, I don't, I don't believe there's an ego in the sense that most people use the word. To me, ego is a focuser. It's you're focusing on something that you like or you're focusing on something you don't want. That to me is it, ego is the thing that enables you to focus. That's how I define it. But what I was going to say is there's a part of us that what other people would call ego that wants to be in control. And that love, that love is something that I live in and it's so expansive and your ego cannot swim in that deep ocean. It doesn't have the capacity. And so this part of us that's limited will say, no, I might die. It's that part that will die. There's a great little line from this book called Hope from the Flowers that um, this caterpillar says um, to, this caterpillar says to a flower, um, how does one become a butterfly? And the flower says, you must want to fly so much that you're willing to die. And he go, that you're willing, oh, what is it? Oh, shoot, I'm so sorry. How does one become a butterfly? You must want to fly so much that you're willing to, to um, you're willing to die. I think that's what it is. And he goes, ah, to die. And she goes, well, what looks like you will die. But what, but what, what is really you 
will live. I hope I'm saying it right. Sorry, Trina Paulus, she's the author. But it's a great quote, and it's like, what we think will uh, is us is will die, but who we really are will live. That's what I've seen. And so I think if you keep doing it, you're going to just expand into this huge vat of love where that which you thought you were can't, can't swim in those in those tides you know well it's fascinating that you use the word control because i'm remembering that before the sensation came on i was in meditation but i had this mental posture where i was basically thinking to myself there's nothing that i really need i don't need anything i and it was this idea that the ego wasn't there quite as much mm -hmm. just like you were describing so i i think that is what probably happened and then the ego came back and said, no, you can't do that. And, and also in my second book, It Ends Upside Down Living, I talk about some of these other similar cases of people that have described these things. There are many other people. I don't, I'm not unique in this at all. But there are many who have gone way further in terms of the experience. So I, I cite the examples of Adyashanti and Dr. David Hawkins, two well-known spiritual teachers. And they do talk about this sense of an ego death. David Hawkins talked even about a terror that was involved with it because that which he thought he was, was essentially dying and he was letting that go. But when those who have experienced this let it go, they describe this immense, indescribable sensation that is so blissful and positive. Yep. Yeah, I live in that blissful state because it's so, it feels so good. And when you mentioned that it feels pleasurable, you know, it's like love, but beyond love and it feels so pleasurable. That's it. I mean, I kind of feel like I'm dissolved. I don't even feel, you know, fully human. I feel liquefied, if you will. I'm like very, I feel very liquefied. So I love what you're saying. So you've done some studies on, or you've found studies about, let's say, um, tele telepathy or, or telekinesis or uh, psychic kinesis or remote viewing, pick any one of those. And I would love to just hear what you found. Like the one about the government, I knew um, how they did it at Stanford University where they were uh, studying psychic remote viewing. And there probably was other places too. I just knew people from Stanford who were doing it um, so that they could go into places and discover where things were in other countries, like where ammunition supplies or cameras or troops, you know, and they could use their psychic ability. Can you talk about what you understand about that? Yes. And, and the context here for why this is significant in the exploration I was starting with is if consciousness can be somewhere outside your body, think about that. That challenges the conventional view of consciousness and the brain. That's not supposed to happen. So I, I spent a lot of time looking at these phenomena because it, it implies that we all need to rethink science and then also much about ourselves. So remote viewing in particular really blew me away because I, I had no clue at the time that the US government ran a program starting in the 1970s and it was out of SRI, Stanford Research Institute, and it went until the 90s and they probably, who knows, have other programs like it now, but this is publicly acknowledged. And there are declassified CIA documents that describe what happened. They show the, the scientists that evaluated it and they say, and actually in my book, An End to Upside Down Thinking, I included those documents so you can actually see them. Uh, they're publicly available. They say remote viewing is a real phenomenon. Implications are revolutionary. So that's a pretty big one. Uh, but to give an example of what they were using it for, this was for psychic spying, especially during the Cold War. So there was a competitive aspect to this to try to have an edge over Russia and other nations. And one of my favorite stories is one told by Jimmy Carter, former U.S. president. He acknowledged that there was a downed Russian bomber that was lost in an African jungle and the radar systems couldn't find it. So they used remote viewers to psychically see where this bomber was and they were able to locate it. That is pretty remarkable. And, I, and I, it's especially remarkable because in some of the other studies, which are also remarkable, like at Princeton University, they ran over 650 trials. There was a lab run by the former Dean of Engineering there where they would have a person go to a location and the remote viewer was supposed to perceive where that person was. Now, the difference between those examples and the, uh, the, one, the Jimmy Carter example is that in the Princeton cases and others like it, someone knew where that person was. So there was a known target that they were still psychically tapping into. But with the downed Russian bomber, no one knew where that was. None of the U.S. officials knew and the remote viewers were still able to find it. 
Yeah, that's so fun. I heard, I think Russell Targ was there at SRI. He's someone I heard lecture back in the 90s and it was fascinating because he was talking about the remote viewing and how they would use um, art, like they would just draw what they were seeing in their mind and then the drawing could be could be sussed out a lot of times. That's how I remember it. I, I might not be, it was a long time ago, but um, it was so interesting, at least the way he was describing it. Um, that's so cool, yeah, because we have, to me, the thing about consciousness is it is not, it's not anywhere. It's everywhere, if that makes sense. It's 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 yeah. everywhere, and there's no, there's no uh, limit to, to distance. It's not limited by distance. It's not limited by, by surroundings. It's not limited by who you're with. It's not limited by anything. That consciousness goes out, and I know this so clearly because, like, if I have a shift in consciousness or if I have a certain level of energy, people that meet that level from Finland, from Argentina, from Hawaii, from, you know, all over the world, they, they reach out and it's so fascinating. They don't even necessarily know me, but they feel it. And people feel my energy or can feel your energy. You know, when you walk, when you see someone walk into a room and you might be 40 feet away and you go, that guy has good energy or that guy has bad energy. You can feel it. It's visible. It's, it's visceral. So I love what you're saying. Um, and then did you learn, I, I want to read those studies that you were talking about where they show how to do it. Um, I took some classes on remote viewing and I liked it. It's really fun. But how do you, um, like, did you learn about how to do it yourself? It's not something I've tried to tap into. I just, for whatever reason, I haven't been super interested in it uh, for myself, but I have looked at how it's, how they teach people. And often they teach the remote viewers to go into a meditative state and that clears the mind. And let me give some context for that because it, the way I look at the brain based on my research is that the brain is involved in the way we experience consciousness, but it's sort of like a filtering mechanism or a blindfold that gets in the way of this broader consciousness. So when you quiet the mind with meditation or other techniques, then the broader reality exposes itself. Another analogy that has really helped me is one from the philosopher Bernardo Kastrup. He says that we're all whirlpools within an infinite stream of water where water is like consciousness. So we're like, we're individuals, but we're also interconnected as part of this broader stream. And when you do certain meditation techniques, the broader stream opens up. And this stream, like you say, is beyond space and time. So remote viewers are able to perceive things not only far away in distance, but also in time. So you can see things backwards in the past and also in the future. Right. Yeah. And it's so cool. Um, <laughs> and then, um, you know, and one of the things that remote viewing can be helpful for, I had a friend uh, that I, I met. He was actually like um, surrounded by FBI agents all the time because because he had a skill. He was English. And again, this is in the 90s. And he was a guy who had found through just a, uh, he just woke up uh, one day and, and realized he was I think he was an engineer at Lockheed or something. And then he realized uh, where a plane was, or I can't remember the details of it, but it was so fascinating. And he started going on to like Good Morning London shows and they would have somebody, he would, he would say, okay, create a box and put the box somewhere, you know, when I'm, while I'm on the show, so I know I'm not, so you know, I'm not trying, I'm not connected to the box. You create the box, you have somebody that drives and sends it somewhere in London and then I'm going to tell you where it is and then I'm going to tell you what's in the box. So he was able to do that consistently enough that he had like a gig on this, whatever the morning show was that he was on. Um, we watched a couple of them and it was really, it was really fascinating. Um, and so he was using it both for the, I think the MIA, the uh, English version of, I guess, our CIA. And he was also using it uh, just for entertainment. Um, so it can be kind of fun, but you can find, you know, missing children. You can find your car. I've had experiences where I've used it to find something that I lost without, I didn't know where it was. And it would be, I would, let's say, look all over and then just tune to where the thing was without thinking my mind, you know, being in that quiet space and then literally walk to, let's say a bookshelf. It wasn't on the bookshelf. It was behind the bookshelf, behind a poster board underneath a pile of clothes that my 
let's say my stepdaughter at the time had put there and then it was behind that under that and it was the thing I was looking for and you know looking all over the house couldn't find it had looked through the whole room that she was in couldn't find it because she had borrowed it and then there it was and I walked right to it so you can use it for you know finding your car keys or in that case it was a, a tape recorder <laughs> yeah well I've, I've heard many cases like that I mean it's amazing <laughs> but um for my podcast, it's called Where Is My Mind? I interviewed Russell Targ, who ran the US government's program, but also yeah. a, a psychic woman who ta talked to me about working with detectives and police departments to find a missing person yeah. using psychic abilities. It's incredible. Yeah. I have a friend who does that. She actually stopped doing it because it was too gruesome for her because she kept finding people that had been, it was too hard for her. So she now she just does psychic stuff on a TV show. But um, but yeah. yeah, but you can help. They, they can definitely help. And there are a lot of detectives who are open to it, even though they don't totally believe it. But they're like, wow. They yes. Know you know, well, so it's an interesting thing to because there's so many places that the psychic stuff opens up. So what have you experienced with people like, um, let's say you're talking about um, telepathy? What what kind of things have you learned about that? But with all of these psychic abilities, what I've learned is that they are innate, that we can all do them. But some people might have a, a natural ability that's just stronger, sort of like in sports. Anyone can dribble a basketball, but then you have Michael Jordan or LeBron James, superstars. And many of the people at the U.S. government's program, for example, they were not only trained, but they had this natural ability. Right. But it's still very significant that we all have it, something innate within us. And the classic study with telepathy, this is one of the examples of, it's called Six Sigma statistical results, meaning that the odds that it's happening due to chance alone is more than a billion to one. So it's been replicated by many different researchers. And I want to emphasize this because it's, that's science changing stuff. And yeah, the that's classic, like point zero 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 like for a billion zeros one, you know, that, and usually it's point zero zero one that is significant, significant. Yes. So yes. <laughs> that's pretty cool. So go ahead. And, and it, this is the sort of thing where if it were a different area of science, you'd say, oh, this is real. We don't need to debate this anymore. And, and in our current world, it's not like that because this is so controversial. But the classic study is you have two people separated. So we'll, we'll call one person Bob, and he's put into a meditative state in a room. And there's another woman, Jane, who's in a different room. And she's not someone who claims to have psychic abilities. Sometimes these are college sophomores. And the experimenters show Jane an image and she's asked to try to mentally send it to Bob in the other room. And Bob doesn't know what she's looking at. Okay, so she does this for a while. And then Bob comes out of his relaxed state. And the experimenters show him four images. And they say, which of the four was Jane trying to mentally send to you? And if there were no effect at all, if Jane is not transmitting anything, you'd expect the person in Bob's room to guess correctly one out of four times or 25% of the time. It should right. approach that if there's no information transfer. But that's not what happens. It's closer to 32%, which statistically is a massive change. And it, this, is, this is what's happening over and over again. So it suggests that even someone not trained in psychic abilities is able to transmit, transmit something, not 100%, but something. Yes, and I, I, I believe where it is innate for everyone. I love that you use that word because some people might have a greater proclivity. And, and what I've noticed a lot of times is a lot of people that have a proclivity for being more psychic often had a reason to be aware of everything around them like it was dangerous as a child or something like that and yet also found a way to be relaxed and that combination of greater awareness and relaxation seems like it's really helpful but it is innate in everyone and and it's really fun when people start to tap into it that's one of the things that a lot of my clients will tap into it more and more because as they get calmer as they open up more as they let go of their old programming, they become more more attuned to the stuff that is innate, their natural capacities to be connected across time and space and past and future and all of that stuff. So I love it, I love it, love it, love it. So, and that's an interesting study. There was a study that um, I was assigned a partner in again in the no this is in the 2000s i was assigned a partner she lived in san diego i lived in los angeles and we made a plan to meet i think at 7 30 every morning in meditation at our own prospective homes and it got to the point that we met every day and then we would talk on the phone when we had time after we did this and we were going to meditate for a certain amount of time each time i think it was half hour 45 minutes something like that and so um what it got to the point was 
first I could feel, oh, she's already there and she's in meditation, let me get in. Or I could feel, and this is, you know, whatever the mileage is, 200 miles, 150 miles, something like that. Then I could feel, oh, she hasn't even come into the room yet. She's running late. And then I could feel when she was there, but she hadn't got into meditation yet. And I could feel the depth of her meditation or not. Mm. And we'd go into meditation. We'd be in meditation roughly around the same time. And then I could feel when she popped out and I could feel when I popped out or if she was still in it. And then what was weird is as we were doing it, I started to get all these downloads about her. I just knew things about her whole life. She got all these things about me. And then we would have these conversations where we were just like, oh my God, I can't believe you knew that. I can't believe you knew that. It was just crazy how much we understood about each other just from meditating at the same time in our own separate homes. Yes, and it reminds me of the principle in physics and quantum physics, it's called entanglement. Yes. Where you have two particles that are distant from each other, but when you affect one, I'm simplifying this, when you affect one, the other one is affected at the same exact instant, meaning that something's happening where there's a connection. It's even faster than the speed of light. And Dr. Dean Radin from the Institute of Noetic Sciences wrote a book called Entangled Minds, which is attempting to make this connection of what you're describing. Maybe there's a connection between this part of physics that we know is true. Even Albert Einstein had to admit it, even though it was reluctant. He wanted to try to disprove it, but he, he realized that there was something real to it between that and these phenomena of consciousness that you're describing, there's something interconnected within the stream that we're a part of. Yes, totally, totally. And then what is, um, what do you call psychic kinesis? Is that the, is that the, is this psychic kinesis where you bend the spoon? I'm trying to show you, it's very reflecty here. Um, is that psychic kinesis? Is that what you call it? Yes. So this is the ability for the mind to impact matter, which conceptually makes sense if we're all part of one consciousness then if you shift consciousness then you should be able to shift matter because matter is a product of consciousness it's it's like a reversal of the way we typically think about things because when i had learned about i had heard about topics like manifesting before my this journey started and i remember thinking these things are impossible because you would need to touch something to impact physical reality what do you mean that a mind could do it and now i realize no the mind is everything. We're all interconnected as part of this mind. So th there, it, it's possible to alter physical reality. And what you're showing there with the bent spoon is a typical example that people refer to. There, this is very controversial. Again, some scientists try to dispute it. The idea that you could bend a spoon using your mind. And actually, uh, Dr. William Tiller from Stanford University evaluated the metallic composition of some of the spoons that were bent and found very strange properties that led him to believe maybe something's happening. Yeah, that's interesting because this spoon, when I, I took a class with a woman teaching how to bend a spoon and the first night it just, I bent, it was stiff, you know, you couldn't bend it I, and I try, I'm strong and I couldn't bend it. And then I was doing what she said and then the spoon doubled. Then the next morning I went into meditation and I couldn't bend it and then I did it again and then the spoon went around one more time and then I did it, tried it the next day and then the spoon ran around the, one more time. So it has three different days of you can't really see it, but three little twists in uh -huh. there. So you can see it and it literally, it feels like it changes because you can't move it, you can't move it, and then it just falls. And so it feels like something's different, but I don't know why, what it is. So it's fun. It's I remarkable. Love I love that he studied that because that is interesting. I'd love to see those studies. Do you have those in your book? <laughs> I mentioned the summary of what he found in terms of the metallic composition. The, the, the more, I would say, scientifically rigorous and that it's been replicated many times and it's much more controlled study with psychokinesis involves people altering the behavior of machines with their mind. Yes. The, cla the classic study is the machine, it's called random number generator. It generates yes, zeros Princeton, and ones. Right? At Princeton, they did this and other places too. And so it's generating ones and zeros in a random fashion. And when you look at the string of ones and zeros, it's 50% ones, 50% zeros. That's what it approaches because it's random. Right. And they might say, look, Karen, I want you to put your mind to that machine and make it produce more ones than zeros. And what do you know? People are able to do that. It's a very tiny effect statistically, but it's a real one. And an interesting finding that I mentioned in the book that Brenda Dunn, who co-ran the program at Princeton, she talked about how people's performance would go on a similar trajectory. In the beginning, they would do very well at altering the non-random behavior, 
or at, it was random behavior that they made non-random, but then they would start overthinking it and they wouldn't do as well. So there's something about just going with the flow, not trying too hard, but also trying at the same time, which really resonates with me in many ways. Oh yeah, and when you think about it, grass does not try to grow. Birds don't try to fly. <laughs> Squirrels don't try to be cute, right? It's just, babies don't try to be cute. They're just cute. It's just natural, there's no effort. I think when you're really in the zone or really have this mastery of stuff, there's no effort to any of it. If, you, if there is effort, the effort is, is part of what blocks us. Totally. And I've experienced that personally in other areas of life. I mean, growing up as a competitive tennis player and playing college, you go in the zone, as it's called, where things are just flowing. You're not thinking too much about winning and losing. I would play much better. And same with when I'm writing books, there's a flow that happens. And I think it's very much related to what you're saying. Yeah. And I love that because it is, it's so exemplified in sports, in creative expression. And it's so, it's so easy to get into when people know how to do it, but it's so it's such a challenge when people have that experience of, oh, I'm in the zone. Oh, I'm out of the zone. I'm in the zone. I'm out of the zone. And you can watch it where tennis players are hitting things that they're not even seeing or basketball players are passing to someone that they don't even know is there. I mean, they, there's no way they could see that he's there behind them or she's there behind them. They, they're just able to do it on, they have a, you know, and you see it with birds, you know, birds fly like this. They all know who's, some one bird will start to lead but then the other bird starts to leave, but they all just go together. They're in a, they're in a consciousness. Schools of fish do that too. They're in a, at least I think it's in a consciousness and that makes them look bigger. It makes them look less like a prey and more like a, a giant predator, you know, for the, for the world of, of things. And then talk to us more about, um, like knowing the future. Can you, do you have like studies that you've seen on that? Yes, and I've actually participated in the classic study uh, at the Institute of Noetic Sciences. It's one of the places they do this. And what the classic study, again, this is Six Sigma, more than a billion to one against chance, highly statistically significant. The, they reversed in time the typical study in psychology where you'll be, in front, you'll be in front of a computer screen and the computer screen shows you images in a random fashion. Some of the images are peaceful, like a mountain or a landscape, something that would not arouse the body. And others might be a violent image or something erotic, something that they know will stimulate the body. And in the typical study, they measure your physiology after the picture shows up. And what happens is the skin responds, pupils dilate, the brain and the heart respond. And it happens at a subconscious level. You don't even realize it. You see the image and you're, you, you respond. What the experimenters did is they said, well, why don't we measure their body before the image comes up. That shouldn't do anything, right? Because how could their body know the future before it happens? That's impossible. Actually, they find that there is a subtle effect. The body seems to respond in the same way. So skin, pupil dilation, uh, heart and brain response seconds before the image shows up. And it's so significant because not even the experimenter knows what kind of image is, is gonna show on the screen because it's randomly generated by a computer. I love it. Yeah, I read that study a long time ago. It's very fascinating. They were having their their and I what I read was that the heart knew it before the brain knew it and the heart knew mm. to communicate with the brain. This is scary or this is peaceful. That's the study. I, I think it was through heart math, but I love Institute of Noetic Sciences. Do you want to tell people what it is? Because I know you're on the board of it. And wasn't it started by which astronaut? Because I love him. Apollo 14 astronaut Edgar Mitchell founded in 1973. Didn't he say, this is something that I, when I saw that he said this, I just fell in love with who he was and with ions, which is he said, when I was out in space and I was looking at earth, I saw that there were no lines around countries. I don't remember if he said that exactly, but it sounds right. Yeah. What I do remember, I yeah. never met him. I, I actually joined ions after he had passed away, unfortunately, but he, he felt the interconnectedness of everything. And that's what led him to, to form IONS. He said, wow, we need to do something to show that we're interconnected. And so IONS studies many of these phenomena scientifically. I love it. And I read Entangled Minds by Dean Radin years ago. And, and I just think it, it made so much sense to me. I love his work. And when you were talking about, um, you know, it works, the, the psychic kinesis works with um, things, machines and stuff like that. This was something that happened with my, my um, computer it was right 
it was um, a couple a week or two before there was the incident with George Floyd and my computer was skipping it had been skipping for like a month where like if I hit the space bar it wouldn't space and I was writing a book and I, I was like you gotta it's gotta work so I call Apple oh it was during the pandemic it was during quarantine I call Apple care and they say well you can send the computer in it'll be with us at least six to eight weeks and I was like I can't do that and they said try Mac Mall, that's local to you so I call Mac Mall and they say three weeks and I think I, I've got nine weeks to write my book I can't do that so I just say I'm gonna fix it with my mind and I just told my computer I just said you know okay I love you let's just do it and the computer literally fixed that day then, then the day that the day after George Floyd um, was murdered, I saw uh, my, my, I was going to go to uh, the grocery store, not knowing that there had been a riot right near the store and a cop car turned over and caught on fire. So I didn't my neighbor said, hey, don't go to that store, go across the street and I go down the, to the other side of the hill. So I went to the other side of the hill. And when I came back, I thought, well, let me look and see what's going on in the news because I don't watch the news. So I just looked on and what was there was Mac Mall, where I could have been taking my computer to get fixed, had been the the main window was crashed open and people were running in, grabbing boxes and running out. And so my computer could have been there with my books in it. And it wasn't because I decided to take responsibility for my computer and fix it with my consciousness. Wow. Wow. Isn't that you crazy? It's crazy. And you probably had an intuition also yeah, that somehow. you had to fix it yeah i mean i didn't know it consciously i just knew i didn't want it to be gone for six to eight weeks and i didn't want to be gone three weeks you know i'm thinking a day at the most so um talk to us about animals and their psychic ability because animals are really on it they're amazing yes <laughs> they i would say are are actually psychic i mean prior to my research i would have said well they have a really strong sense of smell or they can hear things that we can't which is probably true too Oh, but sure. there are many studies suggesting that they actually have psychic abilities. And the favorite one of mine is from Rupert Sheldrake, who was I know a, Rupert Sheldrake. I mean, I don't know him, but I, I met him and I heard him speak. Yeah. Yeah. Very yeah. well known uh, Cambridge biochemist. And the classic study that he ran was on dogs that know when their owners are coming home. And he has a video of the study on his website. So you can actually see how they designed it. Basically, he would have the, the dog owner go away from the home, miles away in a car that's not hers at a randomly selected time. So they, they, he controlled for all the things that the skeptic would say, oh, well, the dog just knew X, Y, and Z. He controlled for all that. And he would have cameras on the dog owner and the dog at home. And what he found is that when the dog owner was deciding she was going to get in the cab to go home, the dog would walk to the window. Yeah. when she had that intention so it's very it's creepy to watch almost that this is happening statistically and you know i noticed this i think i had seen rupert sheldrake's um some of his lectures and stuff before and i remember when i was married my husband didn't come home at the same time he was working and he lived about he worked about 14 miles from where i lived and he had to go on one freeway and then off the freeway um, he was on the street off of our street. So what I noticed, I'd be sitting on the floor, not knowing when he's coming home, petting our dog. And all of a sudden the dog would start to go nuts. And Reuben would run to the windows in the living room, run back to the kitchen where my husband would eventually come through the door, run back to the windows, run and barking crazy, barking back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And I knew if I looked at my clock, my husband would be home in about 10 minutes. He was noticing when he got off the freeway. That's what we timed it to see what it was. And it was just like, it was crazy. And anytime I was meditating, that Reuben would come right to me and make sure, like if I had the door closed, he would like, let me in, you know, I'd get up and open the door. He wanted to be with me when I was meditating because he was so attuned to that energy. I think that's the animal's natural energy. Yes, they're naturally tapped in. And what Dr. Sheldrake says is that pet owners are not surprised to hear the results of these studies. And yet there are skeptics who still discount the possibility of all this stuff. It's they're, they're tapped in just naturally. They don't have the same kind of clouding of their consciousness. That's the way I see it. Yeah, I know that um, we used to say that dogs, or at least Ruben, was a bodhisattva, meaning a person who was so evolved that, or a, a being that was so evolved that they came back just to show other people what it was like to be evolved, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think that all animals are that way in a way because they all have a sense 
you know, they have a, they have a sense of things. They know stuff that they don't have a way of knowing. I see it consistently. And then, um, so since you've been studying this, how have you noticed your own psychic abilities or your own capacities? Have they shifted at all or grown in any way? I think intuition has increased. And maybe I had it before and didn't know it in the same way. I've just started to be able to identify it through trial and error. For me, it's more of a feeling about something. It's a thought too, but I'm able to identify the way I feel when I get an intuitive hit. It's very difficult to describe because I can't, I can't draw it out for you. But there's a, a growing sense that I, I, I know when the, it's the correct direction now. Whereas before I wasn't quite as sure and, and through trial and error, I've started to hone in on it. Yeah, exactly. It's that, it's that capacity to discern it. Yeah. And you can't discern it if you're frantic or if you're trying or if you're efforting or if you're stressed, you can't discern the intuition correctly, I think. And when you are relaxed and when you're letting it happen, it will literally guide you. I, I feel like the universe is my ideal dance partner, a great, a great lead that just dances me wherever I'm meant to be the best, you know, meant to be. Um, because it's, it's a constant thing. So in, um, you know, you also talk about, I had a near death experience when I was 18 and you've studied near death experiences. Talk about that. Yes. Probably the most impactful thing I've studied. It's something that I mention in all of my books because it's so profound. And the classic example is when someone's in a physiological trauma, cardiac arrest is one that scientists look at a lot where the person is clinically dead. So the brain is either barely functioning or it's completely off. It's in a state where the mainstream scientists would say, you should not be able to have any consciousness. And if you are, maybe it's some minor consciousness, like a hallucination, nothing clear. What the scientists find, including Dr. Bruce Grayson from the University of Virginia, very credible people, Dr. Raymond Moody, Dr. Pim Van Lommel, they find that people experience in their consciousness something that's realer than real. And they talk about 360 degree vision sometimes. The most remarkable cases are where people uh, not only encounter deceased relatives or spiritual beings, being of light, so actual intelligences that they encounter, but they hover over their body in an out-of-body experience. Sometimes they actually go outside the, the room that they're in. And when they're resuscitated, they're able to describe to the doctor and family members what happened. And they describe it accurately. That's significant because the skeptical types will say, well, Maybe you did have an experience, but it was a hallucination caused by your brain that's just dying. The problem with that explanation is that it's, if people are accurately seeing things from over their body, that's not a hallucination. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's actually interesting because I used to have narcolepsy. And one day I was doing some inner work on myself and I remembered when I'd been like three or four with all my friends on the on the uh, sidewalk going on, everybody's on bikes. They were a little older, so I had my big wheel. And the sidewalk came up and my bi it was big to me at the time. You know, my big wheel goes up the sidewalk and I lost control and I went headlong into a sycamore tree. I can see the tree now, but I was unconscious for about 20 hours. And I didn't remember this until five, six years ago, something like that, when the narcolepsy got healed. I didn't remember that the doctor, my childhood doctor came to the house and I was on the couch and I'm above my body and I can see him and my mom and dad. And he says to my mom and dad, you have to wake her up every hour, shine light in her eyes or she could die. And so my little brain thought I better wake up every hour. That's narcolepsy. It's a sleep that's very interrupted. So you're tired all day. Once I saw that, I reworked that and I healed it. And I literally, I slept 11 hours uh, not last night, but the night before, like wow. I sleep really deeply now. And in my sleep is, and the doctor couldn't believe it though. Not because he said, you'll never, it's, un, it's incurable. Well, he's wrong. Everything is curable, I believe. So, um, but it had to do with that subconscious programming that was inside that little, little girl that, you know, said, Oh, I don't want to die. So I better wake up every hour, you know? And, yeah. and now I don't have that. And when I died, it was from a, um, I was on a spinnaker and I didn't know how to do spinnaker flying and it was a 40 knot winds. And so this, I didn't have enough weight. I weighed about 105 and the spinnaker went up over the 55 foot mass. So I saw that mass and I'm a good 10 feet above it. And then it went 
inside out and flipped me like I was a whip onto my back onto the ocean and I you know got all the air knocked out went down fast and I was trying but I didn't have any air and I couldn't swim up and then it I just something relaxed and then it was all golden and it was so delicious and I was like oh my god this is the best feeling and I was really feeling like I'm going to go in that direction and then I heard a voice that said you have a choice do you want to live or die and then I thought of my mom and I thought wow she would be devastated you know mm. I'm going to live and immediately immediately I had no air I'd been underwater for maybe two three minutes I don't know four I was far up I couldn't even tell where the up was but somehow I was I got up to the top like like rocket fuel there was a guy from the boat where the spinnaker was he was holding he wouldn't let go of the boat the waves were pretty high like 15 20 feet he's throwing a life a life preserver but there's no way for me to get it the waves are too high I still haven't caught a breath the air was knocked out of me and it hasn't come back so I can't even breathe and all of a sudden do you want to live or do you want to die I was about to ready to give up hmm. finally I somehow I don't even know how I got to the to the life vest I'm there he pulls me in, throws me over his shoulder, climbs climbs up the ladder. They have to pump my stomach and give me mouth to mouth. And um, and then I was able to throw up the water I'd swallowed. Sorry, too graphic. But um <laughs> but and then and but I had tasted that. I didn't know it was a near death experience until later, but I had tasted that that bliss. Mm. Well that bliss that's a, and that choice. Yeah. Well, I mean what you're describing is so commonly reported. That's also what's compelling to me is that there are independent accounts of this, even in children who don't have the same cultural programming. So something's clearly going on. And people are very much transformed from this. I mentioned Dr. Bruce Grayson from the University of Virginia. He's a psychiatrist. So he's looked at it from that lens as well, the transformations in people after the near-death experience. They might, be go they might have been an atheist before, and then they switch completely afterwards. They become much more spiritual. They sometimes even get divorced or change their careers because their priorities have shifted so drastically. And what has stood out for me in my research is the life review phenomenon, which is reported in 20 to 30% of near-death experience cases. And this is where a person relives his or her whole life. But in, in a flash. Post, yeah. Yes. So something's going on with time. Time's compressed, maybe like Einstein's relativity. and what really gets me is that people become those that they impacted in their life. I'll give an example. For my podcast, I interviewed Daniel Brinkley, probably one of the most impactful conversations I've ever had. It's available on YouTube. It's about an hour and a half long, where he's had four near-death experiences, and each time he had a life review. So he was struck by lightning, open heart surgery twice, and brain surgery once. Each time he died. That's the way he described it. But he had a life review where each time he started at the beginning of his life, so there were certain things he had to relive four times and other things where he got to relive the incremental stuff that had happened since the last life review. And he had to relive his combat days in Vietnam where he told me he was vicious in combat. So he had to relive the deaths of the people that he killed and also the pain of the children that no longer had fathers because of what he had done. So needless to say, this was so traumatic for him. He ended up becoming a hospice volunteer. So in his later life reviews, he got to be the dying person in the hospice bed and he got to feel the way in which he comforted that person. So you feel the good and the bad of the way you impact the person through the, that person's eyes. And it really points to our interconnectedness. Yeah, that's, that's profound. And you know, the, isn't someplace in Virginia, isn't there a place where they also work with kids that seem to understand life before that? I had a friend whose son, nobody noticed this but me, but that's because I'd been like so interested in this stuff since I was a kid. But um, one of my friend's sons, when he was like 12, he knew everything about the Japanese um, military. And he described being in, in caves, hiding out, helicopters going down, being in boats. He knew the names. He spoke some Japanese. And he's like, you know, like a, a pole vaulter, cute 12-year-old, right? But he knew the details of stuff that was so clear it was just like whoa what's going on and there's a, who do you know who that guy is in virginia yeah so it's the division of perceptual studies and that's where dr grayson is and also dr jim tucker previously dr ian stevenson he's the one who founded it and they've studied over 2500 of these cases 
children who have memories of what appear to be past lives. And usually the memories are between the ages of two and six years old where the child has the memories and then they start to fade. Typically, sometimes they could be older, but it's remarkable because in the best cases, the researchers are able to find historical records that align with what this little child is saying. And in even stronger cases, I think, there are birthmarks or physical defects in the child that align with the death in the past life that they're describing. And in the rare cases, the researchers have found medical records that prove that that person existed in this alleged previous life. So incredibly, I mean, I'm still blown away by this, but you can imagine for someone like me who didn't believe in these sorts of things, to learn the possibility that we've had lives that we don't remember, it's insane. <laughs> It's pretty freaking cool, you know, when you look at how much we have potential for that's untapped. Mm. You know, I, I realized one day I had been doing this healing practice. This was like 15 years ago, and it was physically arduous. There was a lot of like physical stuff you did. And I was going to bed one night and I thought, oh, there's a buffer for our thoughts but one day we'll be able to just think of something and we'll be there. We'll have mm. it. And it's happening. I can feel that at least in my life more and more. I literally think of someone that I haven't talked to in months or years or decades. And then they, they call, you know, within that 20 hours of the thought or, or I, you know, there's, it's just over and over and over again, or I'll think of a thought and somebody will say the exact words to me that I thought of yeah. in that day. You know, so it's really interesting how much we can be tapped in. You also write about, um, like, um, let me just think of other stuff. So with, um, oh, communicating with the dead, I do that. Tell me like <laughs> stuff, I didn't mean to, but it just started happening and I didn't know I was doing it. So, but tell me what, like, what, what is the science behind that? Sure. I, can I tell you my science? Please, yeah. The first law of thermodynamics, energy can neither be created nor destroyed. It can only be transmuted. So when we die, just the, the body goes, but the energy, who we are, doesn't die. So go ahead. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that totally aligns with so many things. Um, but in terms of the studies where this has been examined, because, of course, it's a controversial topic. Some people will say, oh, psychics are frauds. Mediums aren't real. And certainly not all of them are real. And even the ones that are really good aren't correct 100% of the time, always. Right. But it's beyond what chance would predict, meaning that there's some information that they're tapping into. The Windbridge Research Center has conducted studies with five levels of blinding to control for all the things that the skeptics would say, oh, well, the psychic's just doing X. For example, the researcher, Dr. Julie Beichel is her name, she will get on the phone with a person who has a deceased loved one and that deceased loved one's name will be given by the person and they'll just give the first name. So the, the psychic medium is not even the one talking to the person on the phone who has a deceased relative. It's, it's through the researcher who gets the first name of this person's deceased relative. And still the psychic medium with just that information, not even directly communicating with the person is able to get information beyond what chance would predict using statistics. Now, there have only been a few of these studies, and they're going to do more and more to get replications. But it's still incredibly significant that they, control, they can control for all of these variables that skeptics have talked about and still get results. Mm -hmm. I love that. And, you know, I got to say, I appreciate the skeptics because they cause the research to be a little more st sturdy and, and yes. thoughtful, you know, so it's not just out there. The ways it's happened with me is like one day, my one of my friends, her husband died very suddenly and um, and she was kind of devastated. And then I just heard this, I felt it was him. And I heard him singing, now I don't even know the song, so I'm not gonna sing it, but it was, come on baby, let the good times roll. Just that one line. And I knew it was a message for her and I didn't know why. And so I said, I got a message, I think from your husband. And he says, come on baby, let the good times roll. And she calls me and she says, Karen, that was something that we, you know, they'd been married 30 something years. That's something that we would say to each other every day as we walk past. Like if one of us was sitting down and the other one's walking by, we just like rub our hand across the body. Come on, baby, let the good times roll. And, mm. you know, just, you know, hold, you know, brush the arm. Come on, baby, let the good times roll. So he was communicate that, communicating that to her so that she could know that she wasn't alone and that he still wanted the good times to roll, you know? Yes. That he was there. And I've had it with so many 
so many experiences. I have like probably 30 different times it's happened, but I don't do it. It just happens. I don't, I don't have the, I couldn't be in one of those studies because it just happens. I don't know how to say it's going to happen right now, you know? Yeah. It's spontaneous. Right. And that does, there are many of those cases too. And what you described is, is common in that the reports are of information coming through that's very specific to that person. Right. And it's usually kind of quirky, um, idiosyncratic, like something very specific and that the person knows. Maybe other people will be skeptic, but the person who's experiencing it, they say, I know it was my deceased loved one. Right, right. And I knew it was her, her husband, even though I didn't know why mm. that line was significant. You know, like you can feel who it is a lot of times, which is interesting. Like I've felt people with people like, I never met her husband. I never, another friend of mine, her father, I never met her father. I was, a, I was a, like taking a nap and I felt this energy and I thought, oh, that's my friend's dad. And I tuned to him and he kept saying, you have to tell her she did the right thing. I'm proud of her. She did the right thing. I'm proud of her. So I try to call her and her phone is out of the country and it's not answering. So I didn't leave a me I couldn't leave a message. So I sent her an email and said, hey, I think I got a message from your dad. He says he's really proud of you. You did the right thing. He's proud of you. You did the right thing. She calls me uh, uh, later uh, and says, oh my God, Karen, she's from Austria. Oh my God, Karen, I had, a, my father gave me a house and my brother and my sister were using it illegally in Austria and I'm in Los Angeles and I had to, I had given them part ownership, but I had to take it back. And I was so afraid. I felt so bad. I didn't want to hurt my brother and sister, but I didn't want to get in trouble with the, what they were doing that was illegal. So I was in my, my hotel room and I was crying and I was saying, dad, give me a sign. Did I do the right thing? Did I do the right thing? So he was said, I'm proud of you, you did the right thing. Wow. <laughs> I know. It could be. And when she died, when <laughs> my friend died, her family was there and I told the story and I watched all of their faces go white because they all realized that it hadn't been her being mean, it had been her being guided. Mm. Unbelievable. It's when, when these things happen, how do you explain it? Especially when it happens to you. There's no denying it. Yeah, it's just I just say energy cannot be created. It can only be it cannot be created nor destroyed. It can only be transformed. Yeah. That the the body dies. The body the body dies, but the consciousness, the consciousness, which I think is infinite and eternal and all around, it's it it just still is there. And you yes. can't. I mean, you can't. I mean, how could it be that whatever has created us isn't also a great recycler? <laughs> That's the term I use. It's the recycling of the water in the stream. So it's like you're a whirlpool and then the whirlpool dissolves. It delocalizes. The water doesn't leave the stream. It just changes into a new form. And to me, that's the death of the body. Right, right. It's the same thing. Like if you have if you have a pot full of water over heat, it's going to go into steam. But the water hasn't the, the molecule has changed energy, but it hasn't changed. It's still the H2O, you know? Yeah. So, um, and that, and then if it goes into a hard form like ice, it's still the H2O, but you're perceiving it in a different form. So I love what you just said, because it's a great way to explain it. Yes. Awesome. Yeah, it's, but again, I, I did not think this way before. So you could imagine what an adjustment it is to think about this recycling yeah, process. Doesn't it, doesn't it feel like your whole mind is like brand new? Yeah, it's a death in some ways, a yeah. death of this old person. But in other ways, it's just the new version of me. Like there, it hasn't died. It's hard to explain, but that's the way it feels. Yeah, it's the pure version. I, I would say it was a pure version of you, yeah. but the part of you that you were programmed to be, it has, has left. Because we all get programmed, which is natural, but most of the programs are not accurate their programs of limitations but we are unlimited we are much more powerful than we can imagine that's how i think about it yeah well one of my favorite analogies is that consciousness is like the sun that's always shining yes and there are clouds that get in the way and it's our job in life as we evolve to remove those clouds so we're getting the pure rays of light that have always been there but they've just been obscured absolutely and i think of the sun that to me the sun has been my teacher because the sun shines all the time so i think okay i'm going to just shine my love 
It's okay if there's clouds, I'm gonna shine my love. It's okay if it's night, I'm gonna shine my love. It's okay if they're under a tree, I'm gonna shine my love. It's okay if they're in a house, I'm gonna shine my love. And I've used the sun as my, as my symbol of what's possible in mm -hmm. terms of loving unconditionally. Because the sun shines unconditionally. Right. Like it doesn't matter if it's nighttime. It doesn't matter if the moon's out or the moon's not out. It doesn't matter if there are other stars. The sun's just shining. You know, it doesn't matter if you're inside, if you're in a car, or if you're under the covers, if you have a mask on, the sun is still shining, even on the other side of the world. So that's something to me that I thought, you know, I want to take that image and use it for my own edification. Yeah, that's a good one. And it's powerful. And it's something that we're tapping into that is our innate power. Yeah. Yeah, because it seems like like what we're talking about and what these scientists thank you for all these scientists are doing these studies. Mm -hmm. You know, you're studying stuff that people have known for all of all of man man's experience in life. There are things that you can see, you know, like the pyramids and the um, what you call it, Stonehenge different places, there are places where we still don't understand. When I was in Egypt, there was a, um, they put a, at Abu Simu, they put a, a symbol, they put a, um, they put a dam in, so they had to move this temple. Before they moved the temple, every year on the guy who was enshrined in the temple, it, the sun would come through a certain area of the temple and hit this jewel in, in the, um, embodiment you know the image of the guy the statue of the guy and this and that would do something special i can't remember i can't remember all of it but what happened was the when they moved it with all of our technology with all of our understanding with our modern science they could not set that temple so that the sun would do it like it did it before uh. so now there's a lack in that temple of the sun hitting this on the birthday of that guy. You know, like, like they're, they had something going on, you know? And when you see these pyramids, they're huge. And there's, and then you see the other things at the temples, it's like the, the, the size of the rocks. It's just unbelievable how much something was happening. People have known things. And also I read a book a long time ago. It was about, I think it was called the story of Pi or something like that. And in the third century, and pi is 3.14. In the third century, somebody understood pi somewhere in South America. I read this book like 30 years ago, so forgive me. So, uh, someone found it in South America. Someone found it in Asia, and someone found it in Europe, all in the third century before there was communication of those things in that. Wow. So, you know, like there's, oh, that's so trippy, you know, the third century, pi is 3.14, right? You know, there's like, <laughs> it's just that there's such an understanding of things and people know things, people know things a lot of times. You see someone and you go, that's the person I'm gonna marry or you see someone and that you think I, that's where I'm gonna be working or that's what I'm gonna do. And you know it even sometimes as a kid and then it shows up in your life. And so there's so much, there's so much more power and energy we have. Is there anything else you want to share? Because I'm enjoying this so much and it's so interesting and I love that you found the science for it. And um, it's just so exciting to talk about. Well, what you were just saying is a really important point that's been a theme of my research, which is that there's so much that we probably knew a long time ago that we're just returning to. This, that word amnesia comes up a lot for me. We seem to be a species that has, has some kind of a blockage. Uh, I don't fully understand it, but why is it that we are more primitive in some ways? We're more technologically advanced, but maybe something has been lost and we're returning to a more advanced state. And maybe it is getting those clouds out of the way. And there, at some point in the future, we could have the, the combination of the advanced technology and the advanced consciousness to move into a, a better civilization. Yeah, that sounds fun. And I think the path, at least from my own experience, is when you when when a person is in love unconditionally, and by love I mean happy, joyous, free, easy, effortless, relaxed, um, present, uh, approving, celebrating, um, admiring, respecting. When you're in that state, that to me seems the path. 
because my psychic abilities have always showed up more from being in that state more than ever before my capacity to bend spoons or my capacity to fix my computer that to me seems the path that's one of the things i teach my clients but it's just such a it's such the best path plus it's the most fun path <laughs> but yeah. it heals your body it heals everything and it seems like that's the area and i imagine when they're doing the studies that people are in their version of what love is or or the zone is or mastery is you know there's some place where people are in that consciousness where they're allowing it to flow and it's flowing yeah. that effortlessness yeah and the term unconditional love is what comes up it seems like universally that oh. that's what people are experiencing unconditional love is that state of high consciousness and maybe it's the ultimate state maybe that's what consciousness itself is and with that i found also in, in my life but in my research the the principle of non-attachment is just part of it where it's not like we don't have desires things that we naturally want to have or things that we don't want but the attachment to the outcome starts to go away and that takes away from nervousness like in sports for example if you're attached if you're one point away from winning a tennis match and you're attached to that outcome then you might play differently whereas if you're not attached you're just going to play more freely it's not that you don't care it's not a passivity but it's it's you're not bound to whatever you're fearing or desiring it's relaxed and alert. It's aware and focused. Yeah. It's real. That's really cool. I love that. And it's so, it's so interesting. Sports is such a great avenue for people to witness it. You know, in when people are, you know, hitting the ball, when people are playing the bat, whatever they're doing in whatever the sport is, you see things where people are doing stuff that's so intuitive and you can see it on video, you know, of people doing stuff where they're not, they're not in their head. Mm -hmm. They're in that free space. And I think that's what makes the masters in, in the, the athletics is the people who are able to get out of their heads and be in that space, be in that space where they're fully present, where they're fully enjoying the moment, where they're fully at ease and there's no, no effort, no trying. And instead it's this intuitive thing. Oh, this is when you hit the ball. This is where it's going to go. This is how you do this. And you just boom, 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 knowing. Yes. And I love to watch athletes under pressure to see how that changes. Some athletes are able to keep it under pressure and others, the attachment creeps in. And I just know this from my athletic career it happened to me so many times where you start thinking about the results and it clouds the flow. It's not the same flow. So it's how, how can you stay in that state regardless of surroundings? And that's in many ways our human challenge. Yeah, that's, that's actually what I teach is I teach something that I, I call a true mastery university. And it's this practice of being you're so in the flow and you know the result you want, but you're not attached to it because it can come in a different way. That's better. It always comes in some way that is even more tuned to you. And it's amazing like how, whatever the result is that you're wanting, whatever area of life that you're wanting it, it can come to you with such specificity to you that is so specific to you that it's just mind blowing. It's like, it's like there must be something out there that cares so much about you and you and me and all of us that it's bringing stuff that is so specific when you get out of the way. And you can bring stuff that's so specific in the negative way too, if, you, if you're if you creating that. But if you wanna be in that place where you're shining all the time, it literally can transform your entire life in a way that is so, so specific to you. It's, I, I'm not even sure I'm expressing it right because it's like, it'll take, you know, let's say you, like in my own example, just cause I, can, I know it really well, you know, I studied acting, I studied mind body science, I studied epigenetics, I studied uh, American Sign Language, I studied French, I studied in, um, Spanish, I studied etymology. Um, all these things coalesced in what I do now in such a specific way that it's, it's like it's unbelievably fitted, just it's like tailor made for what I do, you know? And so that's, it's like, it's like there's nothing wasted in our lives if we can really pay attention because every single thing that you thought was a terrible thing is not and it's all coming to serve you in some way yes 
And what you're describing, the way the way I talk about it is authenticity. It, it, what comes through when you don't have the clouds in the way is your authentic self. And it's it's like we're puzzle pieces and we're all different pieces. So we have a uniqueness of what we bring through. But when we're in that flow state, it's able to come through very naturally. And like you say, it can be beyond what our brain could even compute. When we think about creativity, it's something science doesn't really understand. Where does a new idea come from out of nowhere? Well, I would say it's coming in from elsewhere in the stream and we don't have as many clouds blocking us. And then we become vessels and vehicles to express that in our authentic way. Absolutely, like channels. We're just allowing it, we're like the hose. <laughs> we're the hose and the and the energy is the water that goes through it, you know? <laughs> and you could turn the hose off, but why? <laughs> I love it. This is so cool. And I want to share one more thing about once when the a little bit after I had done this thing, the girl actually who taught it came from Princeton. She was in nursing school at Princeton and they taught how to bend spoons to the nurses. Mm. Um, so I love that you're from <laughs> Princeton. But the like a little maybe a couple of weeks after I'd done this spoon thing, there was a problem with my plumbing and I had to call a plumber and he was coming to um, do something with something that was big and he couldn't move it. It was like stuck. I live in a pretty old house and it was it was like stuck and he couldn't do it and he goes i'm gonna have to cut the pipe and i didn't want him to cut the pipe that's a whole different you know thing it would take a lot longer and i was uh, so i thought i'm just gonna do the same spoon consciousness to this to this thing so he went to go get the clippers and i just started thinking toward sending energy towards that thing what the whatever it is joint I don't know what it is, Some, something round that they have to churn to open things up. And um, I just started to send the energy to it. And before he, he was getting ready to clip, I said, hey, before you do that, could you try it one more time? And he goes, oh, okay. Opened it up. <laughs> wow. and, and one other thing I just want to say, because you were talking about that study about the images. There was a study, it might have been at IONS, I can't, it was in Northern California, but it might have been at IONS. And they had people in really, you know, energy could not escape most energy could not escape the, mm -hmm. the things they were like i don't know what they were lead or something and then people had um so one person they were all another two two partners and one partner would be connected with like a blood pressure pulse brain wave and the other one was also connected to that and one was a sender and one was a receiver receiver and what they what they did was a sender would regulate their own physiology, drop their blood pressure, drop their heart rate, the other person's blood pressure, heart rate would go down, they'd go into an alpha or a theta wave, and then the other person's brain starts to do the same thing. And so, you know, people talk about praying for someone. To me, one of the best ways to pray is to change your physiology while you're thinking of that person and send it to them so that you're in the same physiology that you know they want. Right, you're, you're synchronizing with them. It's this entanglement principle, but also getting on the same frequency or wavelength. Yeah, Seems. but I'm getting them on my wavelength because I don't want to go into their wavelengths. I don't right. want to be, if somebody's sick, let's say, I don't want to be in their sickness. What I want to do is send them that peacefulness, that mm. calm, that healing energy, that relaxation, which is the most restorative, you know, the parasympathetic nervous system is the one that people can get the most rest and rejuvenation from, the most health from. So, so if you want to help somebody else, the best way is that you get yourself relaxed. Yeah, meditation really helps with that, but there are many other methods, breathing exercises. Each person might have a different preferred method. Yeah. But there are practices that help with this, for sure. Absolutely. And, and you're right. Everybody's different. Some people like to dance. Some people like to write. Some people like to go for a hike in nature. Some people like to pet their cat. They're all, yeah. valid. They're all valid paths. Yeah. It's a matter of finding what works for you. Yeah, exactly. Well, Mark Gober, you're just fascinating. I love what you've been studying. I, I love your books. Let, tell everybody the names of your books again in case they want to get them. Sure. Well, the one that we discussed primarily today, it's called An End to Upside Down Thinking, and it's the first book in the series, and it talks all about the science. 
for these sorts of things. Then there's an end to upside down living, which is more of the spiritual philosophy. So I talk about not attachment and these enlightened states of consciousness. I studied the awakening journey, including my own journey. And then the most recent two are an end to upside down liberty and an end to upside down contact, which is about interactions with non-physical beings, including what happens in near-death experiences, but also lots of other phenomena. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. And I love the end to upside down thinking theme. It's just so great because really most of the ways people think are an end to upside down thinking. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, Karen, what's been interesting for me, I didn't realize there would be more books after the first one. I didn't expect to write any books, uh, but I got this passion that I had to do it. And people would ask me, are you going to write another book? What's the next one going to be on? And I would say, I can't even imagine writing another book. But as I research more and more, I realized that so many areas of our world are upside down. <laughs> So it's like a, it was a very good primer that I didn't even realize at the time. I love that. I love that. And it's so true. It's so true. We live in an amazing world. And when we write ourselves and get right side up, it really becomes super fun. Yes. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, I just really appreciate you. I hope everybody who's listening that you enjoyed this and that you learned something and you should try some of these things bend a spoon or, or send somebody your, your relaxed physiology or tune to someone you love. The thing about the people who are dead, I noticed they're all in a certain frequency that's really high. That's why I can tune to them more frequently than I used to be able to. And that high frequency is, it feels like love. It feels like joy, freedom, fun. And that high frequency seems like they're, they're right here. And when I tune to it, I'm, I'm in it. That's my state now. But when people tune to it, they can they can perceive. You can't perceive someone when you're missing them. You can perceive someone when you're relaxed and you're open. Even if you're just looking at a beautiful lake, that beautiful feeling opens you up and now you can start to get understandings of things. It's so fascinating. Let me so, add something to that. Yeah. You reminded me of a study that I, I talked about in my first book because when scientists have studied psychic mediums who claim they're communicating with the deceased, some would say, Maybe you are doing something psychically, but it's not with a dead person. You're just picking something up telepathically, which is an interesting theory. But you describe you, what you said is what the scientists have shown as well, which is that the, the brain acts differently in a mediumistic psychic phenomenon versus just something like telepathy. And mediums describe this. They say, look, it's different than just regular psychic. And when you look at the person's brain, something different is happening. Yeah, I actually have a friend who's a neuroscientist and he was, he did the brain, he did a, a, a CAT scan of one of those guys who's like on TV. I don't know who the guy's name was. He wasn't somebody I knew, but he said that when he was doing his psychic stuff, he was in Delta, which is deep sleep. And, um, and so it was really interesting, um, you know, how that guy was, I guess, I don't know. I'm sure everybody's different in the way they do it, but it's fascinating. It's fascinating. Yes. So we have so much more power than we think. Please um, access your power. And you can reach out to me on storieswelove.show.com if you want to read, uh, see other episodes. And Mark Gober, you can get The End of Upside Down Thinking with Mark G O B E R Gober. Thank you so much, Mark. This was super, super fun. And I appreciate you so much. And let's stay in touch. Yes, definitely. Thank you. Uh -huh.